Welcome to Thrive Radio. I'm your host, Amy Montgomery, entrepreneur and digital marketing agency owner. Today, my guest is Carrie Prejean. He is the founder of a Strategic Business Advisors LLC with over 35 years experience as a CFO in both industry and uh, as a consultant. Carrie brings a wealth of knowledge to the table. He holds a bachelor's degree in accounting, a CPA license, and is certified ontological coach with New Field Network. Carrie has helped numerous business owners transform their companies into well-oiled machines by providing actual financial data, eliminating dysfunction, and implementing long strategic planning. Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Amy. I'm really glad to be here today. Yes, definitely. So can you start with sharing your journey of being a CFO and then now using that knowledge to help businesses scale? I don't know. You want to go all the way back to the beginning in college? <laughs> yeah, why not? Okay, so I graduated with a degree in accounting and went to work for a couple of big Fortune 500 companies, not at the same time. Worked with Arthur Anderson, a CPA firm, big CPA firm at the time. And a client hired me away from there. And it was, I feel like, this was back in the late 70s. So they were, I think they were doing a few million a year in revenue, which is pretty decent size back then. And what I found out was the owner didn't know how to read the financial statements, like not at all. He's an engineer. And as I worked with more and more small to medium-sized businesses, I found out the owners really didn't. The financial statements were like a, a page full of numbers to them. And they would like look at cash and maybe sales and we make a profit, but didn't know how to analyze and didn't know what. And the typical thing was the accounting department hands off the financial statements. So the owner says, look them over tonight. If you have any questions, ask me tomorrow. And they never have questions. Unless something really looks weird because they don't know what they're looking at. They haven't been trained in accounting. They're not supposed to know. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I started developing was, you know, making an interpretation of financial statements and putting in as much of the layman terms as I could, showing them the ratios and what they meant and what are, what are financial statements about saying about your business in terms of financial strength, liquidity, profitability, efficiency. And when they began to catch on, oh, those are some distinctions they didn't have before. Then they could start making some better strategic moves to the business to improve things on the financial statements. The other thing I saw with financial statements is they come two weeks to 20 days at the, after the end of the month. So you find out too late, there's nothing you can do about last month now. Yeah. So I developed what I call dashboards. And, and I don't know if I was the first one to come up the name or not, but I don't remember having anybody else, anybody else having, quote, dashboards at the time. And the reason I call them dashboards because the dashboards on your car, they let you know when something's not going right. <clears throat> You're running out of gas, your battery's not charging, your engine's overheating, your tires are... Uh, underinflated, whatever it is. So the dashboard that we give to the owner every week gives them a six to 10 week cash projection. Do you have any big icebergs in your cash flow coming down? What do your receivables look like? What do your payables look like? What does your inventory look like? Are your taxes being filed and paid? And depending on the business, maybe you have a whip report for a construction company. Maybe you have a cost reduction report for a manufacturing company. Have a couple of e-commerce clients. They look at sales, act they look at activity on the website. How many visitors are coming a day? How many are new visitors? How many returning visitors? How many sales are we making per day? What's the average sale? So you're looking for those kinds of trends and what they get to do at that kind of, that's on a daily, in fact, there's a, one of them gets an, an hourly sales report. And based on what that dashboard is telling him, they can actually use different ads, different, they can do ads on, on text, they can do them on email, they can do them on different spots on the internet and they can drive sales with that, not having that data. And they can see what's selling well and what's not. So that's really what the dashboards are there to do, to give you some actionable financial data to where you can take action during the month. If anything's not going well, you can fix it before it comes to problem. That's generally the way things go is that nobody does anything with it. Or everybody's too scared to do anything with it until it gets to be a critical mass. Then they go dump it in the boss's lap. And then the boss is frustrated, mad, and been doing stuff that Number one, they haven't had any training to do, and they really don't know how to do it that well. And they're mad because their employees just don't get it. Yeah. You know, why, why can't my employees do this? And so with the dashboards and financial statements, that's where I started from the CFO background. The other thing I saw was that most business owners are not good at building an organization. Again, what are their two biggest strengths? Visionaries, they see possibilities where other people don't. They take action, and they're, they're the good revenue generators. That's what got them into business, those two things. Yeah. So when they start getting distracted and all the other things in business, like how do we put that uh, process together in, and what business owners get caught up in is do it my way. Because I started the business, I still own the business. And this is the way I did, this way I made it work when I first started. So just do it my way. Here's the problem, <laughs> the problem with that. 
Nobody's going to do it your way exactly. Nobody's going to think like you. Entrepreneurs are about 20% of the population. The other 80%, they want a paycheck and hours and benefits and guarantees. They don't want to take any big risk. <clears throat> so the employee's not going to see it like the business owner. So even though they try to do it like the business owner wants them to, they're not going to be able to do it. And as you build the organization, let's say you start with just the owner and maybe an assistant, and then you build, add a few more people, add a few more people. Next thing you know, 15, 20 years down the road, you got 20, 50 employees. And there are no clear, written down, this is how we do this function process. So everybody that's involved with it has their own idea of how it's supposed to look. So everybody's going to do their own thing. And it makes for a dysfunctional, you know, the, the gears don't mesh very well when you do it like that. Yeah. So one of the things that's very easy to fix, you come up, have the people involved, come up with a process, and they're not like some big complicated narrative, just like a recipe, three yeah. tablespoons of flour, two eggs, beat on high, whatever. Nothing real complicated, but just kind of like in a fast food restaurant, you can have a handful of teenagers run a, a fast food restaurant because all the processes are written out and they just well, real easy to follow. Same thing with a business. So when you can get that going, it gives the owner the ability to begin to trust that my management team can run the business so that I can go do what I do best, go be visionary and go generate revenue, right? Beyond that, it's now, how do you design your business in the future? Everybody talks about, oh, I want to take my business to the next level. What does that even mean? Next level business. Um, and a lot of businesses don't really have a clear idea what that means. For me, it means that now, as a business owner, you can concentrate pretty much on being the visionary and the main revenue generator and work with the management team to make sure that everything's still going well. Just one, one hour a week, that's it. But you're not going to be out in the weeds of the business on a daily basis like you used to. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you're not designing where your business is headed, what's going to happen to it? The market, competitors, suppliers, changes in customer taste, all kinds of other factors, they're going to push your business around where wherever that goes. So unless you're consciously designing what's going to satisfy me about my business in terms of the revenue it produces, profit it produces, how much time I can take away from it, what's going to be my market, my geographic footprint in terms of market, what goods and services am I sell, what kind of culture are we going to have, what kinds of employees do I want to have working for me? Those, all those kinds of questions. When you can focus on and get real clear about what's going to satisfy you in terms of enough action in all those areas, Hit the thing a lot of people do. We've been doing what we were doing 20 years ago, and we don't know why it doesn't work so well. Yeah. All kinds of things have changed the last 20 years. That's why it's not working so well. So it's those three areas that I've learned to help business owners um, turn, again, manage by the numbers and take their business to the next level. Love that. So how can business owners create a structured environment that both supports action-oriented employees and meets the needs of average workers who create structure and rules? Again, the processes will do that for you. If you have clear processes that everybody's clear on, think of an aircraft carrier deck, right? There's all kinds of stuff going on there. They got this elevating the deck, the pulling planes from below decks to up and de taking them back down, putting armaments on them, fueling them up. They got the guide wires to, to catch them when they come in. And most of the people on the deck of an aircraft carry are between 18 and 22 years old. Think of the average 18 to 22 year old right now. You can't get them off that phone for five minutes to have a conversation. So yeah. how do they take that age men, and I'm thinking we're now too probably, and have them do these military precision move maneuvers with these warplanes on a deck? Because they drill, they know what their job is, they know what everybody else's job is, they know how they're synced together, they know when the timing is right, and they pull it off. Imagine if you could have that, and I'm not saying have military precision with your business, although some people would like that, but just have a nice, clearly defined set of processes and the manage the way the people, the way the managers manage the business, make sure the processes are being followed. That helps employees get engaged because now they're real clear on what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. The other thing that I try and get on is to be real clear on is what are the results you want produced? Don't worry about your way. They're not going to do it your way. What are the results you want to see produced at the end of the day? And do you have any time constraints? Do you have any budgetary constraints? You can be real clear on these are the results I want, then that's what you're looking for. They're going to produce the results that they want. And if you have good processes, more, more likely than not, they're going to produce the results you want consistently day after day. And life gets a lot sweeter that way. But a lot of business owners you talk to are frustrated and resentful. <clears throat> they're working 80 to 100 hours a week. They're having to do all kinds of stuff they're really not trained in and don't do that well. They don't like it. 
They don't know why their employees won't step up. And they tend to live in moods of resentment and resignation. And what I work towards in terms of them being satisfied is they begin to work more in moods of peace, gratitude, ambition, and joy. Like when they first started out. Yeah. Because they don't have all they don't have all the stress of the business anymore. We've taken that away from we move them out of the day-to-day -day management because the skill sets of an entrepreneur versus the skill sets of a manager are pretty much diametrically opposed, right? Managers want nice and steady, boring, monotonous. Entrepreneurs want, where's the next rodeo? Yeah, that's <laughs> so true. So true. So you talk a little bit about um, eliminating dysfunction. Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about that and the systems that you help put together to um, make things a little bit more um, systems dependent than people dependent. Let's talk about dysfunction for a second. Most business owners, when you say we're going to eliminate dysfunction, they go, what do you mean? There's no dysfunction here. Well, do you have some processes that aren't working? Yeah. And you start looking at some of these processes. We have these all these chronic breakdowns in this process. Yeah. That's what's called dysfunction or in another way, does not function. The system's fine. The employees just won't follow it. Again, prima facie evidence, you don't have a system that functions well or it's dysfunctional. So again, clear processes that everybody gets. Everybody knows what their job is, everybody else's job is, and the manager is managed by having to follow a process, this function is gone. And again, the, the whole thing about being systems dependent rather than people dependent, <clears throat> what happens in business sometimes, you bring in someone who's been with the business a while, and they do some special job. They do some special whatever, but nobody else knows how to do it. They don't show anybody. It's like they got this black box of knowledge that they can only perform this. Well, what if they get sick? What if they die? What if they quit? What if they retire? What if they have falling out with the boss? All that talent goes out the door with them. So that's why it's important to have processes and document that every everybody, anybody who wants to learn how to do a process can do it by picking up the, the document, the, the binder that has the processes, rather than somebody has a specialized knowledge and now the business is held captive by that person. So you don't want to be people dependent, you want to be systems dependent. I like that. So if there are business owners that are listening and they're out there managed, they're very into the details, they're into the weeds, how do you help them? And maybe what are some tips that they can, maybe first steps they can start to focus more on the high level strategy? Kind of what I've already mentioned before, having actual financial data to where they're not having a, they're not going to sit through a half a day of going through accounts payable or accounts receivable or coming up with a shipping schedule or really what will kill them. But they'd rather get their gum scraped than have to sit there and put together a process. Most business owners, that's, after about an hour, they're going to watch, look at their phone, they're on their laptop, they're, they're, they're gone. Getting actual financial data to where they can manage, they can get a good look at their business every week from about a 10,000 foot level. Make sure you have good processes in place and that the management team is managing the business based on those. The owner's real clear about the results they want to produce. And hit the big thing. It's a big deal of trust. Right, because the owner started the business, he's still owns, he's grown the business. It's like his baby, his identity, his ego, his self-worth, his financial worth, his income, everything's dependent on that business. And they want to take really good care of it. So it's really hard for them to turn that baby over to employees who've never really shown a whole lot of initiative or, or gumption or take the bull by the horns and, and do it. It's, it's really tough. And I don't recommend just turning it over. Okay, I'm out of the management today. You have to have the processes, number one. You have to be real clear on the results you want to produce. You have to have a management team that's willing to manage by the processes and they're committed to producing results. And when the manager sees that happening, they can begin stepping back. But it's not like you're in the weeds today, tomorrow you're totally withdrawn. That's not going to work. Yeah. But give it up three to six months depending. The owner has to be committed to it, has to be committed to, yes, I'm going to back out of the business and can't go rushing back in to save the day. They have to let the management team learn how to do it. That's quote, that's a tip. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. And you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to be willing to trust your people, especially your management team, to handle things. And you you, you can't you think of this. You know what a helicopter parent is? Mm -hmm. They hover over their kids and they don't let the kids experience any pain or suffering or they don't let them fall down or anything. Same thing with your business. If you hover over your management team, you're not going to give them the ability to make mistakes, skin their knees, whatever, and, and learn how to actually manage the business well. And they're going to make mistakes, I, I promise you. And as a business owner, if you look back, you've made mistakes. 
Yeah. So be willing to give them a little space to, to learn on their own. And there's at least some mistakes made. But the result down the road in terms of you being able to like, you want to take four weeks off? Take four weeks off. You want to go to, you have some family thing where you're going to go to, I don't know, Europe even. You have some kid, you have one of your kids get married in Europe. You want to go to Europe for a week, go for it. And you can trust that your management team is going to take care of the business because the processes are there to help them keep things going like a well-oiled machine. Like that. So you also, you help with long range strategic planning so that businesses can design their future. And you've talked a little bit about that. What does that process typically involve? It involves uh, the owner. Again, I, I always focus on satisfaction. And to, for me, what my understanding of satisfaction is a matter of enough action. You know, what most people walk around with, they have this thing of, if I in my life were more better different, I'd be happy. Define more, better, or different. Until you define those, it's not going to, it's going to, you're going to get more of the same. So again, getting the business owner to sit there and, and look out some point on the horizon. What's gonna, where do you want you, what, what point on the horizon are you going to head towards? And by the time, when you get there, what do you want your business to look like? What's going to satisfy you in terms of revenue, earnings, all those things I said before. And okay, looking that far out. So what are some of the intermediate goals and, and targets we're going to have to set? And what are some of the shorter term goals we're going to have to set? Who's going to be assigned the responsibility for making those things happen? And you don't want the owner doing most of them. You want the owner focusing on the visionary part. His management team can focus on the execution. And you have quarterly meetings to see, okay, these things are supposed to be done this quarter. They're done? No? Yes? Okay, they're done, great. If they're not done, what happened? And again, the, the whole thing of commitment is you want to make sure that your team is committed. And by committed, I accept no excuses that this does not happen. And when you give that up, of like there are no excuses to fail. There's no, no possibility you're going to fail. You will find a way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what are some common operational inefficiencies that you see in small or mid-sized businesses and how can those be addressed? Because we've talked a little bit about the documented documentation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, but what if the doc, what if the process is actually a hot mess? What do well, you that, that, okay. So I don't actually write the processes for the business. It, it would take me months because that, there's so many things that I have to learn. What you do is you get the leadership team that's involved with the process and their people who are involved with the process. People actually do the job on a granular level. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are the results boss wants to produce. Now, what do you have to do in this process to make sure that happens? And you get, they might get to be for manufacturing and, and shipping and accounting and the different parts of the business, get them together so they can coordinate their actions to where the process will flow smoothly. And usually that's where things break down. Accounting wants it done one way. Manufacturing can do it some other way. Shipping's going to want to do it some other way. Billing's going to want to do it. Sales, everybody has a different idea how it goes. And then they have all these little factions that are fighting that the owner has to go play referee for. How do you ensure your, your approach remains tailored and avoids generic solutions that fail to meet specific client needs? How do you tailor your services? Right. <clears throat> okay, so or there are some dashboards that are common in pretty much all businesses, like cash projections. Everybody needs a cash projection. Some businesses, like your e-commerce businesses, they don't need receivables. They don't have receivables. Everything they sell is for, it's paid at the time of sale. But if they're probably going to need payables. They're going to. You definitely want to have a, a payroll tax, sales tax, income tax, and a real estate tax dashboard. You want to make sure those are all being filed and paid properly. But again, from there, like you're a manufacturer, you want to have a whip report, work in process. Common operational inefficiencies depends on what's not functioning well, where are the bottlenecks, where are the breakdowns. That's and then you know, the ones that the business owners are like really involved in that they really aren't trained to do well, uh, or you have competing factions within the company of operations wants to do it this way, logistics wants to do it another way. That's typically where you're going to see. That kind of stagnation, especially if the business owner is not able to spend much time doing the visionary stuff, they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's like, what we've been doing for the last 20 years and it's just not working so well. Yeah, it's a lot of it. It's just not having the processes and, and everybody doing their own thing and you wind up spinning your wheels and things seem to go nowhere. But like I say, you're stuck in second gear. Yeah. If there is one piece of advice that you would give yourself when you first started out, what would it be? When I first started out, yeah. let me give you a little back. I think that 
uh, thinking of something about being more proactive as an accountant, because when you go through accounting, they teach you, at least when I went through, what they're teaching was the good accountant is a good scorekeeper. Scorekeeping is fine, but it's always about this is what already happened. It's not about, and this is what you can do, do better. And that's really what I've developed over the last close to 40 years, was learning how to talk to business owners about how you can, do some things you can do to do better, or what do you think you can do to improve. But one of the big thing that has been a, a, probably the biggest factor in my life is my mentor. And this is about 35 years ago. He said, do you want to know secrets of life? And I said, yeah. He says, getting exactly what you want, being ultimately satisfied. I was like, yeah, man, that'd be great. He goes, you know, how do you do that? Ask for it. That's what you ask for what you want. He says, no. He says, how are you going to ask for it if you don't know what it is? You're going to have to take the time to reflect on what is going to ultimately satisfy you. And over time, that might change. The other thing you're going to find out <clears throat> as you quote, hit some of those things you thought you wanted, you're going to find really, you really didn't want them. You're going to want to kiss a few frogs along the way. Kind of like relationships. When you're a teenager, you don't really know what kind of relationship like it's going to best suit you. Yeah. I found out early on, crazy, I'm out of there. <laughs> but crazy looks fun at first. Crazy <laughs> looks fun, exciting, but then crazy, it's crazy. And that's when it's not fun anymore. So yeah, as a, if you haven't really thought a whole lot about what's going to satisfy me, what will be enough action for me in these different areas that I will be ultimately satisfied. If you can focus on that from an early on age or even from right now on onward, life gets much better. Because once you decide on what you want, especially can you do it down to the detail, <clears throat> it's very easy to look at it. Yeah. The hard part is not knowing what you want. Just bumping around. So is this it? Is this it? People quote, I'm looking for happiness. Yeah. Happiness is something you generate from within. It's a choice in your narrative, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> anyway. I wish I had that advice when I was young. In your 20s, <laughs> when you're sitting here thinking, what do I want to do? <laughs> yeah, it, it took me till I was 35 for, for somebody else to tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So if there are people that are listening that would love to work with you, what's the best way to contact you? Probably my website, strategicbusinessadvisors.org.org. <clears throat> There's a bunch of buttons on there. You contact me and we can have a, a free consultation, talk about your what your goals are, what your situation is, and see if there's some way that I can help you get to where you want to go. Be okay. happy to. Perfect. And I'll put all your links down below. Carrie, thank you so much for uh, coming on and sharing your expertise today. Amy, thanks for having me. It's been, been a fun conversation. Definitely. And if you're listening, you want more information about this podcast and upcoming shows, you can visit a call to thrive.com. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful week.